Hello, everyone. Travel Rewards has long been one of our most popular topics covered on this particular podcast. Episode nine of our podcast is to this date our most downloaded episode of all time. So thank you so much for listening to that, sharing it with friends and family. Glad that it has been of value to you. But we recognize that we haven't gone back to it recently. And a lot of stuff's changed and a lot of stuff is more valuable than ever. And so today we're going to be talking with Lynn from Families Fly Free, and we're going to be talking about the 80-20 of travel rewards. Sure, there's what's on the cover of, you know, some travel website and you know that it's Instagram worthy, but in reality, you're never going to do it. But families, lots of families are using travel rewards to massively profit and take something that was an expense on their budget and turning it into a bonus, a bonus category that they can do for free and they can act with extreme generosity to friends and family with as well. So Lynn documents this extensively on her podcast, The Families Fly Free Podcast, and she's joining us on the show today to cover that exact topic. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Podcast. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. guys very excited to dive into this week's episode and to help me with this i have my co-host brad here with me today how you doing buddy hey jonathan i am doing quite well yeah this is great going back to travel rewards right we called this one of the pillars of phi way back when we first started with choose a phi and like you said episode nine is our most downloaded podcast i mean that shows how this concept resonates with our entire community and obviously travel has been a bit odd the last couple of years and uh we haven't put a lot of focus on travel rewards but What's so great about Lynn is she takes this from the normal person standpoint. It's not, oh, how can I get 15 cents per point flying in first class and having a shower across the Atlantic, right? It's how can families take a vacation? How can regular people take a vacation or two every single year? And I love that. So Lynn, with that, welcome to Choose a Vibe. Yes. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on today. So, Lynn, we were talking about this concept of travel rewards, you know, for everyday people, travel rewards for families. But my question to you to really start off with is, how did you get into this? You know, why did this have appeal to you personally? So a couple things. I've been a longtime travel writer for different online outlets. And so I get pitched a lot of story ideas. And so I had at one point this couple pitch an idea about how they were traveling around the world using frequent flyer miles, but they weren't flying to earn the miles. That was the light bulb moment for me. I thought frequent flyer miles meant you have to fly to earn them, right? Other things. And so this kind of struck me as the couponing of travel, if you will, you know, and instead of getting a hundred boxes of cereal or toothpaste, I could potentially be able to take my family to travel because we had never been able to fly. I couldn't afford to pay for people to fly anywhere. And I saw this, maybe this was a way we could accomplish that, that same couponing mindset, if you will. So we started into this very slowly. We were buying a house at the time. So we knew to wait till we were done with that process to open our first credit cards. We didn't impact the uh, interest rates in any way. And from there, we earned the Southwest Companion Pass. So one of us could fly free. And then we also, when you earn that pass, that's one of the big things that I teach everyone is how to earn the Southwest Companion Pass. One of you flies free, and then you end up with a bunch more points that you earned to get that pass. So you can fly everyone else with the points you earned. So we took our first trip to San Diego in 2015, all of us flying free, and then the rest is history. Oh, that's so great. So, okay. To get from point A to Southwest Companion Pass, I'd love to hear, was there some skepticism? Because I think a lot of people, when they first hear about this, especially back in, you know, this is pre-2015, right? So let's say 2013, 20, early 2014, like I remember being skeptical, thinking, how could this possibly be real? 
can I actually do this? How much planning is it going to take? Am I going to be able to book these seats? Like all this stuff, like did that cross your mind? And like, how quickly did you jump in with both feet to get the companion pass? Yeah. I mean, I would say my husband was more the skeptic in that regard. He definitely had the, there's no way this is too good to be true. Also, we don't want to get involved with credit cards. We had been in debt before. So he was very cautious about that. I tend to be more of the optimist, like, well, if these people are doing, we can do it too. Let's jump in, you know, but I do spend a lot of my time now explaining to people, helping them overcome that exact concern that it's too good to be true because it really does sound too good to be true. I mean, we fly when it's not a pandemic six times a year, four people free. I mean, that's crazy. (laughs) So yeah, you're right. So after we took our first trip, my husband was fully on board. (laughs) So he was, he was ready to move. (laughs) This is real. After we saw it, we proved it worked that first time. So I wanted to go ahead and address the too good to be true aspects. I think, you know, for people that are maybe just hearing this and they're saying, all right, I haven't wanted to look at travel rewards, but that's interesting. You're saying six flights a year, multiple family members, all for free. And this is doable by regular people. It sounds too good to be true. You know, I think one thing for me is when I think of couponing generally, I think of someone that has five shelves just full of mustard with an expiration date of 2045. <laughs> right. And I would actually mm-hmm. say like, I think that stands up also a lot of soap that you never would have bought, you know, otherwise, or just random third party, you know, you end up with a smattering of random objects with couponing, but with travel rewards, you actually end up with points that can be redeemed for flights. And a lot of us do have some level, even if it's not travel goals, we have travel needs. We have to go somewhere. And so, okay, you know, just to kind of create a little space between the couponing analogy. Now, the next layer of this is the too good to be true aspect you mentioned you know, I I was applying for a mortgage. So I waited till that was over before I looked. I think we should probably point out what are the points of consideration for people that are saying this conversation that we're about to have might be a good fit for me. Who are those people that can, you know, kind of embrace what we're about to go into with a little more confidence? Yeah. I mean, I think that first off, you do want to have a good credit score. I mean, I would say low 700s. Ideally, you want to be out of debt. So that can be kind of your encouragement to go ahead and get that debt paid off because then you can start flying free once you get that done. And you definitely need to be someone who cannot get yourself in credit card debt. Like I said, I've been there, so I can relate to people who struggle with this. And the way I teach people to do it is just, if you're going to use a credit card to earn miles and points with your everyday spending, and I only teach putting your everyday spending on there, nothing that you wouldn't be ordinarily buying. You don't need, like you said, the hundred boxes or whatever of mustard on the shelf, (laughs) right? Just things you're buying anyway. But if you just put your everyday spending on the card, I recommend that you just pay the card off every day or every other day. That's what I like to do. And then it's no different than you using your debit card from the bank where the money comes out immediately. So that way, If you charge something to the card, you go ahead and pay it off the next day. That money's come right out of your account. You're not left with a balance at the end of the month that you forgot. Oops, I, you know, I put $3,000 of my everyday expenses on there and I've already spent that money out of my bank account. So that's a way that you can, um, the temptation to go into debt, if you will, because you certainly don't want to pay interest on these cards. These travel cards tend to have high interest rates and then you're no longer flying free if you're paying high interest on a balance. Yeah, that is great advice. Certainly, I've never heard anybody say pay it off every day or two. But I mean, that's brilliant. There's certainly no downside to that. And like you said, that's much more akin to a debit card. Whereas my advice generally is pay it off on time and in full every month. So what I do is I set up automatic payments on the credit card. So every credit card that I've ever seen allows you to set up uh, link your bank account, which you're going to do anyway and just make it so that you've set up automatic payments, pay full balance, and then I don't need to think about it. And as I've discussed on Choose of I in previous episodes, I keep a little extra buffer in my checking account. So that way I don't have to stress if my credit card bill is a little bit more than normal. I have a couple extra thousand dollars sitting there just to reduce stress, basically. So I know that's not the optimal way to go about it, but just keeping that stress out of my brain is well worth the opportunity cost of whatever I'd earn on that, those couple thousand dollars. So yeah, that's kind of my method, but clearly you can't go wrong paying it off more frequently than that. Right. And and so to your point, paid off every day or paid off 
on time and then full at the end of the pay period. But the key is, and I think a lot of people, when they hear that, you know, credit cards have high interest rate, they think, well, if I put some of the credit card, I'm immediately paying high interest on this debt. So I shouldn't do it. And that's just, you know, not a true statement. Uh, credit cards actually give you up to one statement completely interest-free, which is up to like a, in Brad, in many cases, a 45 day window. And so, you know, with that in mind, if we are using our credit cards responsibly, we're paying them off on time and then full, then we are not paying any interest. So it's just, it's really important for people that are using the credit card to make it from one paycheck to the next. You're going to run into problems if you're financing your debt at high interest rates. But for those of you that are just using your normal spend, paying it off on time and full, you're paying no interest. And whether you use the, you know, more intentional strategy for people that are just getting started, like, all right, I'm gonna try and treat this like a debit card. So I'm gonna make a purchase. I'm gonna pay it off or whether or not you're going to take a little bit uh, less intentional approach and just say, I'm going to use my normal spend. I'm going to pay it off at the end of the month or the end of the statement mm -hmm. period. That's fine too. Just pick one of the strategies, you know, don't be option C where you're just like, well, I can afford the payments, you know? So Lynn, I wanted to take just a quick step back for a second. And just to anybody who is hearing about travel rewards for the first time, I think a lot of this strategy is predicated on opening very targeted credit cards and earning these large sign-up bonuses. So I think that that's what we're doing here. And, and again, as we've just spent the last five minutes talking about, this is for people who are responsible with their credit cards. Pay it off on time and in full. Don't spend more than you otherwise would, right? Like these are the critical things. They're probably 10 to 20 premium credit cards that we would recommend as the top tier travel rewards cards, you're usually going to see something like 50,000, 60,000 point bonuses up to 100,000 sometimes. For the audience, we have all those cards listed. If you navigate to chooseify.com slash cards, so that page has all the top cards that we'd recommend in the travel rewards world. We do earn a commission on many of those cards. I just want to be 100% clear, but that is uh, a nice area where you can find all of these cards at a glance. So Lynn, I, my question for you is, are there ways... So again, this is for regular people, right? The vast majority of the points you're going to earn are from credit cards, but are there other methodologies? Or do you focus like the 80-20 analysis? Is it mostly credit cards or are there other things that move the needle? Well, so I feel like I've taken a very simplified look at how to do this. So this doesn't have to be a full time or a second job for you. You know, couponing sort of becomes that for a lot of people. But rather, this is something that you can learn the process, put it on autopilot. And it, I don't teach opening and closing a bunch of different cards because for me to have 10 cards or 50, like that's way too complicated. I will get confused. I will stop paying them on time. I'll miss something, you know. So 80-20, look at this. What is the 20% of actions you can take and generate 80% of the points, right? So I really only teach about three to four cards. You only have to open and close one of them every four years. And the rest of it is done through your everyday spend. And it turns out, like I figured this out for my family, what's the easiest way we can do this and accomplish our goals of flying around the US, the Caribbean and Europe, maybe every other year. We don't do a lot beyond that, like Asia or South America or Africa. But if you want to do that, you want to go as many places as you can. That's another goal for me. I'm not interested in flying first class, like you said, with the showers on the planes or staying in the penthouse suite at the Ritz. Like if I'm not paying anything, I'll hang on the back of the plane, whatever, like just get me there. I just want to go. And so that's what I teach people to do. And so I have a lot of families come to me like I just interviewed one for my podcast. They're a family of seven. They've already taken three trips since we started helping them in February with another one plant. They brought a goddaughter with them to make it a total of eight, flew her free, and they still have tons of points left over. So Bottom line, there's an easy way to do this instead of feeling like you need to have a membership with every airline and you need to have 10 different cards and all of that. Like it can be simpler. I want to talk about the easy way to do it. So yeah, we've covered seriously. a couple of the basics. <laughs> there's one more little point that I wanted to bring up because you were mentioning the credit score. So this is useful for people. You know, if you have a credit score over 700, basically all of these cards are unlocked for you. If you have a credit score in the 500s, you got some work to do. You're probably not going to get approved for a lot of these premium cards. But I do think there's people out there that, you know, and even you kind of mentioned this in passing, 
that believe that when they get started on this, it is going to tank their credit. I, I highly yeah. suspect that people, you know, are saying it's a fair world out there. You're not allowed to get free travel and apply for a bunch of credit cards and <laughs> still have good credit. And I'd love for you just to talk about what you've seen with you personally and for your audience, for people that have embraced a travel reward strategy, what happens to their credit generally? Yeah. I mean, it turns out your credit goes up. And in fact, this family of seven I just interviewed, he mentioned how that was a surprise benefit to him. Like he did not expect that for their credit scores to go up. And the reason behind that is the banks are extending you more credit and you're not incurring more debt. So thus your debt to credit ratio improves and you're making regular payments on time, which is also a plus to your credit. Now, certainly when you apply for a card, there's a temporary drop. And so when I mentioned like we were going to buy a house and so we didn't want to apply for a card, we didn't want it to drop even by 10 points, right? Because then our interest rate could have been potentially higher. But there is usually a temporary drop, a small drop in your credit score, which is then more than offset later on by the credit that bank ends up extending you and your your score goes up. So even people who do opening and closing a lot of cards, a lot of times they'll have scores in the 800s. I don't teach doing that, but I'm just saying like you can do that even and still have a very good score. Yeah. And Lynn, obviously there's certainly no guarantee that their score is going to go up. We can't promise that. But I agree with you. In my experience, my credit score has gone up We've been doing this for nearly a decade. I think virtually every single person I've spoken to, their credit score net has gone up as well. Like you said, the credit score does drop a few points, negligible amount, but it almost invariably goes back up. So I've never, ever, ever in the tens upon tens of thousands of people that I've worked with heard someone whose credit scores drop catastrophically. I've just simply never heard it. So yeah. As long as you're paying down that balance, you're you're good. Absolutely. All right. We've covered really the two aspects that people that are just thinking about this generally need to just be aware of. I think these are the two kind of, you know, highest uh, reservations, highest profile reservations that people might have before embracing. All right. Well, I'm going to take this seriously and look into it because you should. There really is something here. This is more than, you know, mustard that you got for free because of a coupon. So now that we've covered that, Lynn, you, you kind of set the bar up for how many trips, you know, might be viable for someone even taking a simple strategy. Let's talk about a framework for an easy path to travel rewards for people. Yeah. So number one is you got to get on board with flying Southwest Airlines. And this is because you can pay so many fewer points per flight with them than you can on any other airline. And this is a an area that I think is often overlooked in travel rewards. We focus on the earning of the points, but we don't focus on how to efficiently redeem the points. So how can I pay fewer points per flight Well, you can do that on Southwest and there's a lot of ways to do that. And it's because say like United, you're going to pay 26,000 miles round trip to go anywhere beyond driving distance, right? On Southwest, we flew from Chicago to Las Vegas last fall for 5,000 points round trip per person, throw in a companion pass. Now you're looking at 15,000 for four people to go one place. That's almost half of what one person to fly in United is, right? We did Hawaii in April for 30,000 points total. Oh, I forgot. Southwest is going to Hawaii now, isn't it? Yes. So a lot of my folks, that's like one of their number one goals, I would say, is Hawaii followed by Disney. So you can really, because Southwest varies their points price by the cash price, there's a lot you can do there. And there's a lot of hacks you can play that are all above board. You just have to know how to do them. And even just like the most basic thing on Southwest is once you book a flight in points, you can change that flight. You can cancel that flight. There's no penalty to do so. You can cancel it 10 minutes before your flight, get all your points back in your account. Like I can tell you, like as a mom, I can hardly stand to fly in any other airline for just that reason, because I know I can change or cancel or I can grab like a cheap fare to, I don't know, Grand Cayman because it's available And maybe we take that trip, maybe we don't, but I grabbed it because it was cheap. And then if I decide not to take it, I just cancel the points, go right back in my account. So once you book a flight on Southwest, if the price drops, so like, let's say I book it today and it's 10,000 points, tomorrow it's 5,000. All I do is I go online, I rebook it and 5,000 points go back in my account. 
can I just like clarify? It almost sounds like you were saying if you had to choose between paying with dollars and points, you would almost take the, the dollars and buy the points just because you would rather book with points. Is that what I was hearing you say there? Yeah, absolutely. So I always tell people never book Southwest in dollars, always book in points because you buy yourself flexibility that way. If you book a fare in dollars with them and you have to change or cancel, they still don't charge you a fee to do that, but you end up with a credit. And this credit expires a year from when you originally booked the flight and it can only be used by the person it was attached to originally. If instead you book in points and you change or cancel, the points go back in your account. They never expire. You can use them in 30 years if you want, and you can use them to book anyone. I could book Brad on a flight if I wanted to with my points. So you can use them however you want. So usually what most people do not realize is most of the time you can buy Southwest points at their cash value. And so it ends up being the same to book them in dollars as it would be to take those same dollars, buy the equivalent points you would need to book that flight and book it in points. Then you've bought yourself this flexibility to change or cancel and a no expiration date on those points. That's brilliant. So that's a total free roll. You're saying just basically you're using the same amount of dollars that you would use to book the flight, but just buy yeah. the points. And by buying the points and booking it that way, you've just given yourself all of this free flexibility. So that that's brilliant. I guess just two quick things. So first is, I guess the reason why Southwest flights can be so little in terms of points, like you said, like 5,000 points, it's because their flights are based on the cash price. So there's no like award chart, like a United or Delta or American. And, you know, this flight costs 25,000 round trip, regardless of whether it's from New York to Boston or New York to San Diego. That's how the old school award charts work. But these Southwest flights are based on the cash price. So that is really, really cool. The one thing I really wanted to ask you is the mechanics of that rebooking. So you use the example of, okay, this costs 10,000 and it dropped down to 5,000. And you said you rebook and the 5,000 points end up back in your account. I understand that's like the net, but mechanically, do you book a separate flight and then cancel the first one? Or is there like a mechanism that makes it easier to do that? So the easiest way to do it, we're going to talk about companion pass here again in a Mm. moment. But if you have a companion attached to your flight, you can't do it quite so easily. So I'm going to tell you how to do it without a companion. If you don't have a companion, you go to southwest.com, you click on your flight, you click change, you don't cancel it. You click change, you just pick the same days and times you had. And actually the way their system is set up, it'll show you it's a thousand points less from when you originally booked it. It'll say minus a thousand or minus 5,000. So you click that, you complete your booking, nothing's costing you anything there. 5,000 points go right back in your account. So that's something anyone can do anytime. You can check it in the app. Like I like to just, while you're waiting in line or waiting to pick up the kids at school, check the app, see if the points price has gone down and rebook it if it has. We save tens of thousands of points just doing that. The second reason why I love Southwest so much is because of the opportunity to earn this companion pass, right? And the Southwest companion pass different than Delta's companion pass, different than Alaska's companion pass. Those are one time only. You have to pay for your seat in dollars and then book the other person. And then like Alaska, I think you still have to pay $99 or something for the companion. Southwest, once you earn this pass, you can bring someone with you on as many flights as you want to take for the life of that pass, which can be almost two years. And we have an easy way we show you to always have companion pass. Like that's my step number one, earn companion pass. So to earn that pass, you have to earn 125,000 points. You can easily accomplish that with some credit card bonuses, right? So now you have 125,000 points that you can book yourself, anyone else in your family who's not your companion, and then you add your companion free. All you pay is that $5.60 security fee per way per person. So there's no better deal out there than completely eliminating the cost of one of your family to fly every single time in points or in dollars. So if you have a companion on your ticket, If the price drops, I just recommend you call Southwest and they can rebook it for you, put the points rack back in your account. 
um, it's a little bit trickier. You would have to cancel your flight if you did it online. And I don't recommend doing that because you could potentially use, lose a seat there with your companion. That gets a little bit in the weeds. But Southwest customer service is outstanding. So if ever in doubt, call them and let them do it. And they're happy to. Yeah, that's really, really cool. And, and just one point of clarification, uh, this is to the good for Southwest. Like you said, they are amazing. It's not that you have to pay 125,000 points to essentially buy the companion pass. It's right. earning or accumulating 125,000 points in a year qualifies you for this companion pass. And you still have all those points to then use on all of your future reward flights. So this is only to the good. Right. So at the end of this process, you're going to end up with 125,000 points plus the companion pass if you did it in the right way. So that actually opens up a couple things that we need to discuss. So generally, the way that I think about points is unless it's some sort of special category or special deal, you earn, you know, at one point for each dollar that you spend. Now, tell me if I'm absolutely just wrong, maybe it's $2 or $3 point, but I think, you know, upfront, it's like you spend a dollar, you're going to make a point. So if someone's listening to this right now, they're saying, oh, great. So if I spend, you know, just $120,000 in regular (laughs) spend this year, then, uh, you know, on this card, then great. I'll be able to, uh, get this, you know, companion pass and one of my partner will be able to fly for free. Sounds like winning. And, I would agree with the cynicism in that loaded statement, but what they're missing or what you're missing in this scenario is you do not need to spend $120,000. You can optimize with credit card signup bonuses. And so Lynn, I'll give this back to you. How do they make this companion pass so doable for regular people? Right. So you just, you know, when we know credit card bonuses range from 40,000 to 80 or a hundred thousand points after meeting say a 1000 to $5,000 minimum spend in three months, Southwest has cards. So you pair two of those and you usually have got enough points for a companion pass with two card signups. Now there's some rules in there about how many of each card you can hold and how often you can get the bonus. So you need to understand those rules to get the timing right. But you just meet a couple of minimum spends. You earn bonus points. I never want anyone to spend put their everyday spend on a Southwest or any airline card, because like you said, you get one point per dollar. And there are cards like my favorite number one card is Chase Sapphire Preferred. That would be such a better card to put your everyday spend on because in a lot of categories, you can earn double and triple, particularly on dining and travel. And we're going to be doing a lot of that if you're going to be flying free six times a year, right? So that really, really adds up, especially for my family. You earn those multiple points. So you use the Southwest cards to meet your minimum spend, you get your bonus, you have your companion pass, and then you move on to a flexible card like J Sapphire Preferred. And that's the card you put all of your everyday spend on and you continue to rack up points. And those points, so those are Chase Ultimate Rewards points, they can move instantly over to Southwest at a one-to-one ratio. So if you end up needing more Southwest points, move them over. But what I like to teach people is they can also be used for free hotel stays. You can even book vacation rentals with them. The way we teach flying to Europe, you can transfer them to that airline. So there's a lot of uses for those points. So you just let them sit in that Chase Ultimate Rewards pot until you need them one of those places and then you move them. And when you've got 125,000 Southwest points, like look at my examples of we flew somewhere for 5,000 points per person, 10,000 points. Think how many trips you can take on 125,000 points. And see, now you're seeing how we get into six trips a year territory. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose FI team. Hope you're enjoying the interview. We're going to get right back to it right after these quick messages. Well, let's uh, let's discuss the timing just a little bit more because what you just said is there is such value to earning this companion pass that I dedicate my everyday spend to these Southwest cards until I've hit these bonuses, at which point I may or may not, depending on what my goals are, move over to like a Chase Sapphire preferred, something like that, where I can get double and triple points. But I'm I'm happy with, you know, just one point per dollar while I'm in pursuit of a credit card signup bonus for this Southwest companion pass. But You guys also both just pointed out you need to accumulate 125,000 points within a year. You know, this isn't something that spread out over 10 years. You need to do it within a year. So right now we're recording this end of 2021. You know, when does someone start on this and what are the timing considerations around actually getting these points grouped together, you know, in a close enough way that you can then actually really enjoy uh, said companion pass? 
Right. So this is where it does get a little bit tricky for people sometimes and where you could use some personal support, I think, to make sure you get this right. But at this point in the year, what you would want to do, because the way the pass works, it's good from the time you earn it till the end of the following year. So ideally, you want to earn it early in a year. So like if I earned it in February 2022, it'd be good through December 31st, 2023. So I get the most value out of it if I earn it early in a year. But I will have people come to me sometimes, let's just say in June, right? And they say, oh, but I want it for the two full years. I'll just wait till next year. No, if you can use it this year, we should go ahead and get you one because the way we show you how to do it with the card bonuses very easily, you can always have one going forward. So you might as well have one now and here forth. Now, at the end of the year, if you're not, you know, maybe you'd get in one more trip in December or maybe you're not traveling in December, it makes sense to just push it to the beginning of the next year. And then going forward, you'll get it for almost that two full years every time. All right. So, Brad, I want to give this back to you for a second. I want to ask you specifically about the different cards that are pertinent for this Southwest Companion Pass. And then also, if someone's listening to this now, end of uh, November or December, would they want to just hold off even applying or even starting it until next year? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. So good question. And that was going to bring up, I was going to have a cautionary tale, just kind of interjection here, which was, uh, yeah, the worst case scenario is if you're trying to plan this to all happen basically in like January of 2022, the kind of worst case scenario, and this probably wouldn't be applicable based on when this, this episode's going out, but let's say somebody opened up these cards in early November, right? Hypothetically, we went back in time and they hit their full minimum spend on that card. And the, the points then were hit into your Southwest Rapid Rewards account in let's say December right? That would be a nightmare scenario for your plan to have it for two years. Because then, like Lynn said, it's just, let's say you, when you get those 125,000, it's, you earn the companion pass until December 31st of the following year, right? So clearly you don't want to have your points hit in December of this year, and then only get it for 12 months and a couple days, right? So I think what most people do is to try to open up these cards in, let's say, for me, I'm a little conservative when it comes to this, I would open them in mid December. So basically, there's no way I could screw this up. Or even, you know, if I wanted to make it foolproof, I would open it up in early January of 2022. So I think that's just it it depends on your risk tolerance with this. And Lynn, you I'm sure you can give us some info on specifically like when the points hit, is it after like the exact date you hit the minimum spend? Is it when you pay the credit card off? Is it when the credit card statement closes? You know, there's a lot of little nuances on that. I don't know if that's getting too much into the weeds on the podcast, but do you have any high level thoughts on that? Yeah. So the way that works is the points credit after your close date. So if you were trying to meet the minimum spend, uh, so the points credit in January, like your example, you would just want to not finish that spend till after your December card close date. Or you could just say January 1st to not stress about it. Because there are, we do have a lot of people who, as you said, are trying to time it as early as possible the following year. And so you can go ahead and open the card, say October, November. The key is you just don't meet that minimum spend until after your December card close date or January. But even if you earn the pass, like you said, you know, you have it for next year plus a month, that's okay. Like we can still get you set up to have it for two years the following year. So it's like, don't despair if that happens to you. What you don't want to have happen is like you've collected 120,000 points this year and you didn't get the other five. Like I've seen that happen to people because you start over at zero qualifying points on January 1st. Right. No, that is a brilliant, brilliant point. Or right. An- another nightmare scenario would be if you had two cards, one closed and you got the points in December, the second closed in January, and then you're split. Because like you said, you need to earn these 125,000 in one calendar year. So that's really important. And Jonathan, since you asked me a, a specific question two minutes ago, there are, at least to my knowledge currently, there's the Southwest Premier card and plus card. There's also a Southwest business card. So 
I guess really two of the three of those are going to earn you almost enough, if not enough points based on the bonus at the time you open it. Lynn mentioned the Chase Sapphire Preferred card. And it's really important to note that, and this gets into the weeds a little bit, but the points when you transfer those Chase Ultimate Rewards points to Southwest, they do not count towards your 125,000 that you need to qualify for the companion pass. Okay. But they do count as Southwest points. All right. So they just don't count towards that 125K. But once you've earned the companion pass, you certainly can transfer those Chase Ultimate Rewards points, regardless of what premium Ultimate Rewards points card you have. You can transfer them over and then when they count towards using and utilizing your companion pass, right? Right. So you can use them to book free flights. Yeah. They don't qualify for companion pass. And I'm glad you said that, Brad, because that's probably the number one mistake I see people make is assuming they can move those points over and they will qualify for companion pass. And like another way I like to look at Chase Ultimate Rewards points, if you use them that way by moving them to Southwest, they're really worth double because you're bringing someone with you free on every point you use on Southwest. So you get the most value really out of your Chase Ultimate Rewards if you use them that way. And in terms of the Southwest cards, like this is important to understand in regards how you can keep earning the pass. So there are three personal cards, but you can only hold one at a time. And you can only earn the bonus once every 24 months. There are two business cards. You can hold both of those concurrently. So that's different than the personal card. So when you mix and match all of these, and we like to rotate it between spouses or traveling companions. So one has it for two years. The other one has it for two years. This is how we get to a very simple way to always have a companion pass without having to use your everyday spend. You just meet that minimum spend. You move on from the Southwest cards and switch to a flexible spending card. So you mentioned those, those cards and kind of the, you know, the chase has their own unique rules. Do the Southwest fall under those chase, you know, restrictions, uh, are they included? And you said you're limited to three, you know, help me clarify there. What would make like for a regular person that's just getting started, they don't have any cards right now. What are some that they would be looking at with a little more interest if they're trying to implement an effective Southwest strategy? So you'd want to get a Southwest personal card that would count as one of that Chase has the rule where you can only, they'll only approve you for any of their cards if you've opened five cards or less in the last 24 months. So the personal card would count as one. Then we would have you apply ideally for a small business card. We could get into a whole other sidebar on that, on whether it actually turns out most people can get a small business card. So we'd have you apply for a small business card. That one would not count because Chase business cards do not count in that five total. And then you would move on to your flexible spending card. Like again, I, I like Chase Sapphire Preferred. Really, you'd only be at two of the five with that one. Perfect. All right. And so this is the big point that I think people need to be aware of is that the scariest part of applying for a business card is when it asks you for your EIN, I guess, or your tax identification number or something like that for your small business. And I believe, you know, if you go through kind of an uh, extended conversation on do I have a small business or not, when you come to the other side of that and you say, OK, yeah, this I do have a small business or I have a side hustle or I have a monetization opportunity that's something that I'm pursuing. You can then just use your Social Security number in that case to apply for the business credit card. And that's just kind of the thing that I think people get hung up on. It's funny, little side story here, but the first business credit card that I ever applied for was uh, a Choose FI credit card. And it was long before Brad and I had ever done anything, you know, had ever earned a dollar on uh, Choose FI whatsoever. It was just an idea. I was like, we're starting a blog. And well, yeah, I think I just think this blog should have a business credit card. And when Chase <laughs> asked me for my tax identification number, I was like, I think I can put my social in here. And then, um, you know, and, th and that sort of thing. So just if you have aspirations to be a business owner, you might need a business credit card to start that business. Maybe this is the tool. Maybe one day you'll be sharing with Chase how them giving you this business, this line of business credit was really what you needed to take your business to the other side. So a little point of encouragement there. But right now I was just looking at it. If you're looking at one of these Southwest cards, the business cards, I mean, the bonus is like a hundred thousand points with a minimum spend of two to $3,000. It's pretty, pretty generous. So definitely something to not just gloss right over. Now, I, I wanted just to spend a couple minutes and just again, again, we've said it before, but I wanted you to appreciate this. 
domestic flights here in the United States, now flights that includes flights to Hawaii, the companion pass. So let's say you earn this 125,000 points. You did this inside the calendar year. You got your companion pass. In addition to that, you spent around $5,000, five or $6,000 to earn that. So that's another, you know, 5,000 points that you have. So you're bringing you up to around 130,000 points that you know how to use. The flights on average are costing, you know, maybe around 5,000 points for a cheap flight, 10,000 points for an expensive flight. But you do a lot of these 5,000 point redemptions, but now you have a companion pass and then you also have a dependent that's coming with you. So in this particular case, you would need to redeem, you know, two tickets. So you and a dependent, right, would be 10,000 points. But then the companion comes free. So in this case, you're flying your family of three for 10,000 points or your family of four for 15,000 points. You have 130,000 points. You're going to be able to do a lot of traveling with this setup. And you're, and if you've timed this and you've really tried to get these two cards you know, towards the beginning of the year where these bonuses landed at the beginning of the year, you are going to be flying for free for a very, very long time. And you'll definitely appreciate that you put this intentionality into, you know, this aspect of effectively what was your budget. And Lynn, I have a question for you. So we've certainly described like this nice, easy method, which I love that like appeals to my soul. Certainly. I, and I'm curious. So I guess you're, you're describing, let's say again, this kind of stereotypical family of four, and the one spouse has the companion pass for almost two years. And then presumably the second spouse tries to get the companion pass. So then it's for the following two years and you just kind of leapfrog back and forth. Are there ever instances where spouses could both have it at the same time and keep doing that? Or is that just, does that get into a complication that's beyond the scope of anything you would recommend or this podcast? Yeah, I don't recommend that because it overcomplicates things. Because now, again, you're back to trying to get a companion pass every two years, and it, it really messes with the timing of the cards, and you don't need it. Like, we don't need two companion passes, and I find that most of my families, like in my program, even larger families, they don't need it either. We have enough points with the companion pass to do what we want to do. Do you find that this is something that you and uh, your audience, they're typically targeting, they're really trying to get started with this mid-December to have the bonuses land in early January? Is that typically what people try to do? No, not necessarily. They come to me all year long and we just get them started on a process from there going forward. So, I mean, a lot of people do get hung up on this. I have to have the companion pass for two full years. You really don't. Like, just get it now and then we'll show you you'll always have one going forward. So why not just go ahead and get it now? Yeah. You know, that is the critical point. That's the point that I have always missed on this is right. If you do this right and you continue leapfrogging, then you, from that point forward, you will always have the companion right. pass. So why yeah. it's like crying over spilled milk, mm. right? Like you can't go back in time. So why not just do it now? And and have this optimized going forward. That's All right, brilliant. so the, the leapfrog, I just want to clarify. So if year one, you know, spouse is getting this, is year two, uh, the companion is now alternately, or is it year three that the companion is applying for it? So what you're, we do sort of get into this year end timing on that. So like, let's just walk through it. Like, let's say I'm going to have the, the companion pass for 2022 and 2023. Okay. Roundabout end of 2023, my husband's going to apply for okay. a personal and Got a business it. card. His points are going to count in 2024. He'll have it for 2024, 2025. I do the same thing around the end of 2025. Okay, that totally nails it for you. So then the last piece of this, and I think our audience probably already got it, and, then, and if you haven't listened to episode nine of our podcast, that will truly lock it in, is, well, when we're not trying to lock down a Southwest Companion Pass, what else are we doing? What else are we interested in? And we mentioned it twice in passing, just to chase Sapphire Preferred, or maybe you might be interested in the reserve, depending on your own unique circumstances. But this one, I mean, just unlocks total flexibility. So what comes with travel? Well, a lot of times we travel somewhere via plane, but then we need to get a hotel and almost by miles. One of the easiest ways to unlock flexibility, if you don't know what it is going to be, is something like the Chase Sapphire Preferred or the Chase Sapphire Reserve, being able to earn those ultimate rewards points and transfer them to, you know, your partner of choice, Brad. I think last checking, it was something like eight partners. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I think there's 13 total partners or thereabouts, but yeah, there are a good number of hotel partners and yeah, Hyatt is is my particular favorite. But uh, Lynn, how do you recommend people think about hotels or that type of accommodation? 
So, I mean, it is harder to stay free in hotels than it is to fly free. But if you follow this process we've talked about and you're putting your everyday spend on reserve or preferred, you end up with a lot of Chase Ultimate Rewards points that you can start to do some things like book free hotels with. And I agree. I like Hyatt also. I also like IHG. And that would be they own Holiday Inn, Hotel Indigo, Intercontinental, Kempton. Those are the two best points redemptions. And they're a little different, but you know, in terms of one gives you fourth night free when you book three nights in points. You know, there's some other little perks that kind of help give you more bang for your buck there. Now, another thing to remember is you can use Chase has a travel portal, right? So you don't just have to transfer your points to a hotel program. You can actually book any hotel, even that's not a transfer partner, in their travel portal. And we found Sometimes it's cheaper, like let's say Marriott is one of their transfer partners. It's cheaper to book a Marriott in points using in the Chase travel portal sometimes than it is to transfer the points to Marriott and book it with them directly. So that's something that you would want to check. This is again about efficiently redeeming your points, right? Um, that side of the equation. And then another thing that in my uh, membership program we have talked a lot about is renting timeshares. For pennies on the dollar, not being a timeshare owner, but taking advantage of these people who are, and they have excess weeks or points or whatever, like Disney Vacation Club, for example, and you can purchase from them for pennies on the dollar of what you would ever pay for a hotel room night. And you get vacation rental style accommodations with separate bedrooms, washer dryers, full kitchens. This is great for big families or people who need to like cook their own food. And then you also get resort amenities. You get the pools and the mini golf and the restaurants and all that stuff in a timeshare. So that's a way to, it is out of pocket. It's an out of pocket cost, but if you're not paying anything for flights, this is what I love about not paying for flights. Then you can take your travel budget and do some things like that's going to cost you very little to book the timeshare, but then you can also do some splurge a little bit on things you wouldn't have ordinarily done because you didn't outlay, you know, $350 per person for airfare. So you're not saying that you're using points. I just want to clarify, because I'm totally foreign to the whole idea of, of looking through the timeshare landscape and finding the deals. That's just not something that's a blind spot for me. But you're not using points to do. Where, where are you booking these? Where are you finding these pennies on the dollars opportunities? And, and uh, just to clarify, you are using cash, but albeit pennies you're on the dollar. Cash. Exactly. Right. So there's some websites out there where you can do this, like Koala's one, Red Week is one. You can also work directly with someone. So like we have a man on our team. He's a Wyndham timeshare owner. He'll work with a lot of our members. So for example, you're a Disney guy, Brad. <laughs> so <laughs> he's got someone booked from like Wednesday through Saturday, I think, or Tuesday through Saturday over Thanksgiving at the Wyndham Bonnet Creek which is on Disney property. It's like right next to the Disney resorts for $300 total. Wow. Like you're going to pay at least four to $600 per night at a Disney hotel. And this is a, like, people love this resort. It has just tons of pools, all kinds of things to do. And you get, again, this is a two bedroom with full kitchen wow. washer dryer. <laughs> wow. Very That's cool. That's amazing. And yeah, the cool thing about travel rewards is, you know, again, we don't want to complicate it, but there's always a way to save, right? Like even this is such a brilliant method, but uh, you could use something like the Capital One Venture Card to pay for that. And depending on how, how the coding works, but there's a very high probability that that could be coded as travel expense. And you could just wipe it out with your Capital One Venture Miles. So, you know, there's always a deeper layer here. But again, what you've illustrated so beautifully in this episode is there is this 80-20 analysis. There's a way that you can do this without becoming that second job that you feared, right? Yeah. Or becoming a coupon clipping, I need to think about this every minute. This is just the simple path to travel rewards, truly. All right. Well, Len, thank you so much for sharing so much of your time and your knowledge with us and with our audience. People listening to this, they want to dive a little bit deeper. They'd like to maybe check out your podcast. Where can they find you? Yes. Yeah, so you can find me at familiesflyfree.com. That's also the name of my podcast or social media, all families fly free. Len, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. This was fun. All right, my friends, take action on this. There's a lot of money on the table. I mean, and you're just, you can unlock it just by taking this seriously and taking action. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. 